morning, church family, and Happy New Year. We are going to do communion together. We want to welcome you into our home, into our family room. And so we're going to give you a minute. If you want to go gather your communion elements, if you haven't done that yet, please put us on pause and go grab them as we get ready to break bread together around our table. This morning, um, as we take communion together, I am reminded of Jesus when he broke bread at the Last Supper. Um, One of the things that I read this last week was about how Jesus was reclined at the table. And also at that table was the man who was going to betray him. But Jesus still allowed himself to recline at the table and break bread. He knew who that person was. The other disciples didn't, but Jesus himself was able to recline and break bread. He knew what was coming. The rest of the disciples didn't. While he broke bread, there was a plot to kill him going on. But he was still able to recline and break bread. And so this morning, none of us really know what this next year has in store for us, but he knows. And he wants us to walk in his peace, and in his joy. So this morning, as we break bread together, we just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your life that you gave for us. Thank you that you were willing to sacrifice yourself for us. That you were willing to give your body so that our bodies could be restored that you were willing to give up everything, to give up heaven, to come to earth, to restore relationship with us. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Father, thank you for the plan of restoration that you have for us. Jesus, we receive your bread and your body today, and we simply say thank you, Lord. Can we eat together? This morning we take the the juice, which symbolizes the blood of Jesus. And I think of the fact that Jesus was always fully aware, and he still is, fully aware of everything, and, and yet he chose to sit around a table of people that would make mistakes, people that would betray him, people that thought they knew the plan, You know, and Jesus still, fully aware, was willing to lay down his life. And uh, I believe there's some dreams that sometimes we feel like we know and we have the answer, but it's, it's, it's all about Jesus. At the end of the day, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, none of this would matter. So I want to ask you this morning as we partake of the, of the juice. The Bible says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so, would you join me as we just simply say, Lord, we thank you that you were willing to pay the price for the shedding of your blood. That, Lord, you were willing to lay down your life for uh, us because of your great love. Father, we thank you so much, and we do this today in remembrance of you. And can we drink together? Well, if you were in the service, the week that Pastor talked about hope, in the second service, at the end of the service, I closed the service by sharing Proverbs 13, 12. It's a scripture which says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. I encouraged those who felt like their hope had been deferred and their heart was sick to trust the Lord for what he wanted to restore in their lives. But the scripture just wouldn't get out of my mind. Have you ever had a scripture or something that was almost like an earworm? You just couldn't get it out of your mind. And so I started researching, what exactly does that scripture mean? I started really looking into that scripture, and I think I was caught with the word deferred 
what, what does deferred hope mean? And what is, what is that? The word deferred, you know, we've heard a lot of that about that lately with deferred loan payments. We are great when we're talking about deferred judgments, but when we're talking about hope and we're thinking of things that we hoped for and dreamed for, we don't want to think about that being deferred. And so when we look further at that word, though, that original word deferred, in the original language is the word mashak, and it's used 36 times. And what I found out was it has a meaning much like that of a bow and arrow, like when the bow and arrow is pulled back. Now, I want you to get the real picture of a bow and arrow that's pulled back, because if you don't have the strength to pull that bow all the way back, then nothing happens, right? If you only pull that bow back, that string, a little bit, that arrow is going nowhere. But this meaning is to actually pull it back. And when, when God pulls back something that we're hoping for, it actually causes a strength to develop inside of us, much like that bow. That's what that word is talking about, pulling it back, because when, when all of that pressure, think about if you've ever pulled back a bow and arrow, I remember one Christmas, that's what our son wanted, was a bow and arrow. So we got a bale of hay and a bow and arrow and a target, and outside we went in December in Iowa. And as you pull that back, that's what gives you the potential for the arrow to go further. That's what the scripture is really talking about, the pulling back that happens in us when we have to wait for something. But then when God fulfills that desire, it's like the tree of life. Remember, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. That's where God originally intended us to have relationship with him, where he walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And he wants to aim us back toward that tree of life, life and hope in him. The, the other thing that I found out that I think is really cool about that scripture is it's the same word that is used in Genesis thirty-seven twenty-eight. And that's the scripture that says this. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by Joseph's brothers, they pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Now, I want to give you a little bit more of that story. So this is Joseph. Remember, Joseph is his, his father's favorite. We think of him as the boy with the, with the multicolored coat, right? His dad made him this beautiful coat, and he goes to his brothers, and he tells his brothers of all these wonderful dreams that he's had. And his brothers literally hate him. So they take him, they throw him in a pit, and when they see slave traders going by, they sell him for 20 pieces of silver. And the same word that's used deferred is the same word that this scripture uses in Genesis 37 when it's talking about pulling him up out of that pit. Now think about that. When Joseph was pulled up out of the pit, I'm sure he had to be fearful. I'm sure some of his brothers had to be fearful. They didn't know. This is his father's, their father's favorite child, and they're selling him. They don't know where he's going. They don't know what those people are going to do to him. Joseph doesn't know where he's going or what's going to happen to him, but because Joseph was so creative, he was so smart, and God had a plan. When he, when he was pulled up out, God had a plan. Now, that plan was deferred a little bit, but it was the tree of life when it was fully established because here's what happened. The end of that story is that Joseph not only saved his family from famine, he saved an entire nation from famine. Joseph didn't know that as a young boy being pulled up out of out of a pit, all Joseph knew was he was being sold and that his brothers hated him. This is the same word that's used in Psalm 36, verse 10. It says, oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. Defer your steadfast love to know those who know you. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, you, I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. 
you know, when we're talking about the drawing out of God's unfailing kindness, we're all about that kind of deferment. Today, we can't always see God drawing us out or God drawing us back or deferring as kindness. But it just might be. It just might be God aiming us with more power and more potential to where he wants us to go. So today, Pastor and I are going to look at three people whose hope was deferred, and they needed something that only God can do. And that's really the point of our message today. What, what is needed in your life? What hope has been deferred that only God can do in 2023? What have, has the world or yourself been deferring that you're asking God for in 2023? And so as we look at these people, we're going to hopefully spur you on into knowing how to pray for your life, for your family, for your relationships, and for your health in 2023. Pastor? Only God. That's the title of our message. And uh, I remember a lot of times as a kid, when I get in trouble, my parents would say, only you, Jim. You know, maybe you had the same thing when you were growing up. Um, but the reality is, is when we're talking about hope, it, the hope we're looking for is only going to be found in God. And so we want to challenge you this morning to just open your hearts and receive what the Lord may be speaking to you about this new year about some dreams that you have, some dreams that you had, <clears throat> and maybe some dreams that are going to be brand new and yet to come. They may not come always the way that you think they should or uh, how it should happen, but I tell you what, when you put your hope in God, even if it's delayed, he always is faithful and comes through. So we're going to talk about three different people. And the first one I want to talk to you about is a man by the name of Jarius. Do you remember Jarius in the Bible? Uh, Jarius was somebody that understood authority. And I want to read to you the scripture from Mark chapter 5. It says that Jesus went back across the other side of the lake, and there at the lakeside a large crowd gathered around him. Jarius, an official of the local synagogue, arrived, and when he saw Jesus, he threw himself down at his feet, begged him earnestly, said, My little daughter is very sick. Please come and place your hands on her so that she will get well and live. <clears throat> While Jesus was saying this, some messengers came to Jairus' house and told him, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? Jesus paid no attention to that, but told them, don't be afraid, only believe. And then he did not let anyone else go into the room with him except Peter and James and his brother John. <clears throat> and they arrived at Jairus' house where Jesus saw the confusion, heard all the loud crying and the wailing, and he went in and he said to them, why all this confusion? Why are, why are you crying? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. And they started to make fun of him. So he put them all out. And he took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went to the room where the child was laying. He took her by the hand and said to her, uh, Talitha kuam, which means little girl, I tell you, get up. And she got up at once and started walking around. She was 12 years old. When this happened, they were completely amazed, but Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone, and he said, give her something to eat. <clears throat> there is so much that's going on in this scripture right here that, you know, I don't have time to unpack all of it, so I just want to make a few observations when we're talking about hope and, and, and only God. Um, what I want us to catch is, is we look for vision for this new year. When it appears that all hope is lost, do you view your year, do you view your future with your eyes only? Um, or do you view them with the eyes of God? Because sometimes I think we get those confused. Here, here, just a few observations. They said, why bother? In verse 35, while Jesus was saying this, it said some messengers came and told him your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher? Now that's a really good question, isn't it? Why bother? Have you ever said that? Have you ever thought that? I've worked hard. I, I have slaved at this, but it seems to all fall apart. Just why bother? And you just want to give up. 
And, and, and here we've got uh, the perfect example. You know, the, the answer to that question is actually found in Jesus, who is the answer. That's where we find our hope. And maybe you've had a dream. <clears throat> maybe you've had a plan. Maybe you've had a hope, and it didn't turn out quite the way that you expected it to. Have you ever had that moment? You know, it appears that all hope is lost, so why bother? Why even try anymore? Why even work at this? Why, why invest? You know, if they, in this story, if they would have settled um, or deferred to only what they could see, then they surely would have been disappointed because all they could see is what they could see. But Jesus' response to the situation was, don't pay attention to what others say. Don't look to the world. He said, make sure your focus is in the right place, which is Jesus, by the way, because Jesus is the only one that can truly restore life. And then he told them, uh, and don't fear. Not only did he say, and to answer the question, why bother? He said, don't fear, only believe. When you and I fix our eyes on him, then the next thing he's going to tell us is don't be afraid. Put your faith in God. Believe in him. And this takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? I mean, to actually act upon this, you have to be willing to sacrifice some things. You have to be willing to lay down your agenda and be able to pick up his because there's nothing wrong with wanting things in life. But when they don't work out exactly the way that you plan them, do you get frustrated and quit? Or do you keep seeking the Lord? I remember a time <clears throat> uh, many years ago um, when Lisa and I were uh, trying to get pregnant. And when I say we, I mean her. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a lot of difficulties. Um, we experienced roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. We kept, we kept praying for family. We kept praying for kids. And at some point, it just became so discouraging that I remember my, my attitude and my just kind of souring and, and, and I lost the joy. And I remember it was in that moment that Jesus showed up and spoke to me and said, Jim, place your hope in me. You see, it wasn't the fact that something was wrong with me, therefore he wasn't giving me what I wanted. He was telling me to place my hope in him and that I must believe that God is going to come through because it can be discouraging when you go through difficult times but it's in those exact times that he calls us to believe even when those around us may think or say something differently which leads me to my next observation was did you notice that when Jesus went in to pray for the little girl that he only took uh, a few of his disciples he, he said only Peter right uh, there was a couple others that went with him but did you notice that he said you can come in uh, but the others You've got you've to stay out there. Why, why would he do that? Well, that's because Peter has seen so much. He's been hanging out with Jesus, and he knew what it meant to have this place of uh, having his faith in Christ and believing and, and seeing the miraculous take place. You see, when you're going through seasons in life where hope seems to be absent, when it seems like your dreams are crushed, you need a Peter in your life. You need somebody that that can stand in the gap with you and walk with you. One, one who knows what it's like to go through difficult times and get through to the other side. But your hope's not found in Peter. Your hope is found in Jesus. You can have somebody walk through that with you, but you place that in Jesus. And, and the last observation I'll make about this is if you've got a dream, um, I noticed that it says that when Jesus went into the room, it says that he put the people out. Uh, he walked up and said, why, are you, why all the confusion? Why all the crying? She's only sleeping. And of course, they started to laugh at him. They started to mock him. They started to kind of make fun of that. And so it says that Jesus put them all out of the room. He removed the people from the room. Now, I don't think it had so much to do with the people that he was trying to remove from the room as much as that it was removing the unbelief. When you start to doubt and when you start to worry and when you start to lose hope, your eyes automatically fix on what's wrong. And you're going to have to have times where you're going to maybe have to recalibrate. Let, let me ask it this way. Could it just possibly, could it, could it be that in order for you and I to experience 
hope like Jesus intends for us to experience that we might just have to remove some things in our lives so that we can hear clearly what Jesus is saying to us. Because the truth is this. Jesus, he restores life. Amen. So the second person we're going to talk about today who also had their life restored, but in a different way, is the woman with the issue of blood. Now, just I'm just going to give you a brief refresher on this story, but this woman, we don't even know her name. But most scholars um, think that this was a, an issue with her menstrual cycle. She was plagued with this issue for 12 years. It was a bleeding issue that she had. But she was willing to risk everything in order to regain and have God restore her relationships because she knew that God was the only one who could restore those relationships, who could restore that life to her. Because you see, in that culture, this woman has had this issue for 12 years. So that means that she could not come in contact, in physical contact with anyone. If she came in physical contact with anyone, they would have to go through ceremonial cleansings in order to be clean again. She couldn't leave her home. Even in her own home, there, there would have been places that she could sit and places where she couldn't sit because... If other people sat after her, it would make them unclean. So this, this culture of clean and unclean, this blood issue, left her in a state of perpetual shame. And she had dealt with that for 12 years. 12, I'm sure, long, long years. And the Bible says that she went to many doctors, but they were unable to help her. And so I can only imagine the thoughts running through her head as she knows this teacher and healer is coming to her city and the thoughts about how she was going to get to Jesus. Because remember, in that culture, it would have been considered inappropriate, even if it was her husband, for her to touch a man in public. And so because she was a woman, not only because of the bleeding issue, but because of the bleeding issue, anyone that she touched, they now became unclean. So imagine this sight. Remember in the story in scripture, um, the, Jesus felt power go out from him, right? And he says, who touched me? And the disciples, I'm paraphrasing, were like, Jesus, look, look around. Like there's so many, we have no idea. Everybody's touching you. Have you ever been in like a really big city. I remember one time for Christmas, we didn't do much for Christmas presents, but that year for Christmas, we took our kids to downtown Chicago and we um, got one night in a hotel and we did the carriage ride and the hot chocolate and all of that. It was a great memory. But one of the funnest parts of that trip was we were walking down uh, Michigan Avenue and there were so many people that at that time, our kids were going to Unity Christian School and Mr. Schultz was one of their teachers. And we are walking one way on the sidewalk and Mr. Schultz was walking the other way on the sidewalk. And we saw him and we said, Schultz's, hello. And he said, Machen's, hello. And we couldn't stop. There were so many people that we were just being pushed in one direction and he was being pushed in the other direction. That's what, this, that's what I envision this to be like, just bumper to bumper, arm to arm people. And so this woman, she's going out in this, right? And she's having to think about the, the reality of if anybody notices her, because I'm certain that some people in her world had to know. I mean, we're talking 12 years, you guys, 12 long years of this bleeding issue. And so she's going out praying that she's not noticed because if she's recognized, that could mean the, the end of everything for her. But she takes a chance and she goes out and she touches the hem of his garment. Now, the thing I want to point out about the hem of his garment, you know, we think of it as the hem, but the word that's actually used there that I'm probably going to mispronounce is, I believe they call it a zitzi. It's the corners, it's the tassels, they're blue tassels on the corner of the robe of the rabbis. 
Now, there were four of those corners. It goes back to the four aspects of exile that happened when we, in the garden, when man entered sin. Now, remember when we started this, the scripture that we used is hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. The tree of life came to that woman that day because Jesus, he came to redeem us from in all four of those aspects. So the four aspects that separated us were spiritual, emotional, physical, and relational. And Jesus came to restore all of that. And that woman, she didn't just touch his robe. She touched that part of his robe. She touched the part that restored spiritually, that restored emotionally, that restored physically. She touched the part that restored relationally. And if I were in her situation, that's what I would need the most. Because there would be such a sense of aloneness with that. But because... She trusted God. Like I said earlier, doctors, they tried to help her, but only God. R restoring relationships, restoring her health, only God could do that. She had sought out all other means and methods. And maybe today you feel like your hope has been deferred in the area of relationships. And maybe, just maybe, God is pulling back the arrow to re-aim you. I can't say if it's in the area of new relationships, if it's in the area of restoring old relationships. But what I know is Jesus Christ died for relationships. We celebrated that at the, at the table at the very beginning of the message, right? And Jesus, he restored relationships for this woman, but she isn't alone. He came to restore relationships in all of our lives. And so I'm encouraging you, if that's your only God can in 2023, touch the hem of his garment. Allow him to restore your relationships in 2023. Allow him to bring wholeness to you. You know, i <clears throat> not wearing my glasses because usually I have my bifocals on when I'm at church with you, right? And uh, one of the interesting things is, is I didn't know that I needed glasses until I took driver's ed. Um, what appeared like normal to me was actually blurred and, and colors weren't as vibrant and my, my vision wasn't as accurate as it needed to be. And it wasn't until I took driver's ed and they did the vision, vision test that I realized I needed glasses. Now it's kind of, you know, too bad that it took that long, but I, I tell you what's even worse than that. Not having any kind of vision or direction when it comes to where, where the Lord's leading you. You know, the third person we're gonna talk about when we're talking about hope is about Bartimaeus. Remember blind Bartimaeus in the Bible? Uh, I'll read it to you real quick, but it's just kind of a refresher. It says that Jesus and his disciples, they went to Jericho, and as they were leaving, they, followed, they were followed by a large crowd. And a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many people told him to stop, but he shouted even louder, son of David, have pity on me. And Jesus stopped. And the Bible says that when Jesus stopped, he called the man over. And if we're, you know, if you've heard the story before, Jesus restores his sight, but not before asking him a question. And the question was simply this, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I'll get into that in just a minute, but I thought that was a very interesting question. That's like, you know, having a broken bone in your body and, and going to the ER and they say, what do you want, when it's obvious. But there's many times in life where we can uh, lose vision or, you know, and, and I have, have the same eyesight that Jesus has for us because this story shows us that Jesus and only Jesus can restore vision the way it needs to be in our, in our lives and in our walk with God. You know, this vision that Jesus restores can be both, by the way, physically and spiritually. Uh, Jesus is our healer. I mean, can we agree on that? But Jesus is, he, he's also not just about restoring physical sight, but wants to restore spiritually. Give us his mind. Give us his eyes. And maybe today you're in a place where 
you're recalibrating and you're asking that question, what's next? What's the next step in my life and in the next season of my life? Can I encourage you this morning to make sure that your focus isn't just on what you're asking, but who you're asking? Uh, we, we always want to know what's the next five steps, right? So we can have a plan. We always got to have a plan. Uh, we want to know what's happening tomorrow. But I tell you, it can become frustrating when you feel like you don't have a plan and you're asking God, what direction are we going? Now, take a look at, at, at this with me at the progression of the large crowd that's gathering there as Jesus is showing up. Just like the, the perfect illustration of downtown Chicago, I can't think of a more horrible place to be with all the people <laughs> and crowding in and, and moving in on, on you. But here again, Jesus shows up. And he always attracts a crowd. The problem is, is many people just want what they want. <clears throat> you know, what can I get out of, from God? And here we have a man who's just, he, he's blind. He doesn't know what to do. He hears that Jesus is coming by. And so he starts to yell out. And the people's response is to silence him. It says there that the, uh, many people told the man, stop it, be quiet. It would be similar to saying the word, shut up. You know, we, we, we don't want to hear from you. But Bartimaeus didn't let the voice of the crowd sway his determination because he knew that he was in the midst of the Messiah. So I just want to ask this question. What do you tend to do when the noise of the world gets too loud? What do you do? Do you give up? Do you quit? Do you throw in the towel or uh, just stop? Maybe, maybe we should take some of our cues from Bartimaeus because it says in verse 48 that when the world told him, the people around him, told him to be uh, quiet, it says that he cried out all the more. Verse 48 says that when they tried to silence him, he got louder and louder because he wanted to make sure that he got the attention of Jesus. And when he cried out loud enough, all of a sudden it says Jesus stops. And he looked over at Bar Bartimaeus <clears throat> and he said one word. He said, come. And all of a sudden, what's interesting to me is all of a sudden now the people that were telling him to be quiet were now his best friends. <laughs> they were saying, come on, friend, pal, buddy. Come on, he wants to see you. You see, only God can do this. When you feel like you don't have vision in life, he can take a world that's against you and then it turns around and says, come and bring, all of a sudden he brings healing into your life. He can bring wholeness into your life. The question is never, should we be crying out? But rather, are we crying out to the right person for the right reason? You see, only God can restore the vision that you may have in your life. He, he's the only one that can show you what the next step is. I, I want to encourage you today, whether that means a, a new job, <clears throat> whether it's relationship with your children, whether it's about your marriage, whatever it may be, only God can restore vision. And so we have to come back to him. But the question is, is are you crying out to him? Have you ever cried out to God and he answered you with a question? Do you like that? I don't either. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, you'll cry out to God and he, he, he answers you, but in a question format. And He'll ask you sometimes that which might seem obvious, but it's not because God doesn't know. Jesus asked Bartimaeus what he wanted. He said, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And I would pose the same question he's asking to you today. Fill in your name in that blank. And Jesus is saying to you, what do you want me to do for you? Do you think Jesus doesn't know? No? I, I think Jesus knows exactly. I, I, actually, I think Jesus is the only one that truly knows what we want. But what he wants is for us to wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus is the only answer for what it is that we're crying out. Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want? Not because Jesus didn't know, but he wanted to make sure that Bartimaeus knew exactly what it is that he wanted to see Jesus do in his life. You know, how about you? What do you want God to do for you in this year? What do you want to see different? It's not about New Year's resolutions. It's not about 
because it's a new year, we got to have some new things or new mindsets. We, we should be doing that all the time. But what is the new thing that you see hope has been lost? It's been deferred or you've been waiting for so long. What is it that only God can do for you in your life that he wants to give you vision for? You see, he's asking us, not because he doesn't know, but he wants us to know that he is the source. Jesus is our healer. He's our savior. He's the one that will give us vision. He redeems us and the list can go on and on. It, it's only God. It's only God. And our response to him should be just like Bartimaeus. He said, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And here's what Bartimaeus said that I think, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I think that you and I, we, we have the same response. Here's what he said. He said, Jesus, I want to see. <laughs> I, I want to see. What is it you want to see this year? What is it that Jesus is calling you to partner with him in so that there can be health, wholeness, a joy that's, that, that springs forth? You see, Bartimaeus said, I want to see. Again, that might, might sound obvious, but Jesus was asking him for Bartimaeus' sake, not for Jesus. And he asked you the same for the same reason. So let me close with asking this question. What do you want to see Jesus do in your heart this year? Where do you need to discover a new hope that can only be done by Jesus? Because Jesus, he restores life just like he did for uh, Jairus' daughter. Jesus restores relationships, just like he did with the woman with the issue of blood. And Jesus, he restores vision and sight and healing. Jesus restores hope. I want you to think about that question, and I want to ask you to just join me. Would you just close your eyes with me as we just uh, ask the Lord? And I want you, as I, as I get ready to pray, I want you to take that thing that you hope for, that new thing you want to see Jesus do. And this isn't about just some kind of wish or uh, hope in the sky. This is about what is it that God's speaking to you. And we're going to lay that before the Lord as we simply say, Jesus, would you come and restore hope within our hearts right now? Lord, would you come and redeem our lives? Lord, we ask today that you would breathe a, a fresh new breath of life where it seems like or appears like there has been no life at all. Jesus, will you restore relationships, marriages like they've never been before, relationships with children, with family members, Lord. Lord, would you allow there to be your healing hand and, and give us a fresh new vision. Lord, restore our vision, we pray. Lord, I pray that it's not just about a, a physical sense, but Lord, would you restore sight spiritually in our lives? Give us the new direction that you have for us this year. And Lord, as we place our hope in you, Lord, we ask that you will come and as you transform our lives and restore us, that Lord God, you would fill us with your joy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We love you, church family. Again, thank you for joining us in our home today. We will see you next Sunday. We have a fun surprise in store for you in the sanctuary, which, as you know, is why we are doing a live stream um, today on January 1st. So we will see you next Sunday and know that you are loved. Hi, church family. Thank you for joining us today and inviting us into your homes. Please join me as we walk through our closing prayer. Father, help me to live this day to the full being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself to others, being kind to everyone I meet. And Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen. And thank you again for having us. And we can't wait to see you again in person here in the church. And Happy New Year!